What's going on, guys? Welcome to another awesome episode of Eastern Current. We're excited about this one. I think this is our first ever. We've answered questions before on here, especially when we used to do live recordings. I apologize that we don't do that anymore, but it was just very stressful to try to have to meet a exact recording time every week. Um, but we will maybe start doing some live stuff again this winter when we have more time, uh, maybe some live Instagram stuff and whatnot. But um, we have answered questions that y'all have sent in multiple times, but tonight is just a Q&A. So we've asked for y'all to send in a lot of questions, um, and we're just going to go through. Mike's uh, written down some of the ones that were sent into Eastern Current. I've written down a bunch of the ones that were sent into uh, my personal Instagram and through Facebook and all that. Um, so we're going to just go through and, and answer these questions. And if y'all like this podcast, please you know leave a comment on YouTube or leave a comment uh, on the iTunes or, or, or on any of the podcast platforms or on Instagram or Facebook and just let us know that you liked the Q&A type of podcast. Um, and maybe we can start to do that once a month or, or something like that because I think it would be, or at least when the seasons change, you know, good to, if we're not completely answering your questions uh, with each with the other podcast to kind of dive in specifically to the questions that y'all have and want us to answer. So um, before we get too much further, go check out Explore Boat Works. They're a sponsor of the podcast. Uh, they've got sweet skiffs, bay boats, uh, and they're working on some bigger offshore center consoles and and uh, catamarans and whatnot. Just a really, really cool company that's, that's pushing the limit of what a skiff and a bay boat can do. Um, also, as always, we want to thank our, our best friends over at I Strike Fishing, Dave and Ralph. Um, I could not be more happy to partner with a company. Um, and I Strike Fishing is just... Um, if I had to pay three times as much for them, that's what I would buy. If I got them for free, it's what I would have. So it's it's what I truly believe, and Mike would agree with me, to be the best jig head on the market, hands down. Um, and so definitely check them out. They've got some great products and just a great down-home company. Um, just really cool guys over there. Um, but those are our two people that, that we really care about and that we want you all to know about through this podcast. And, uh, and that, that's about it. But go check out our Facebook page, Eastern Current Fishing. Uh, if you haven't, please leave us an iTunes review. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. That helps us grow. We put in a lot of time here. Um, and, and we're not trying to get famous, but we do want this to maybe become slightly uh, a source of income for us in the future. So uh, with the time that we invest into it. So uh, your support is greatly, greatly appreciated. But let's uh, let's jump into some questions. I'm going to bring Mike on here. I got the split screen working this time for those of y'all watching the video not listening. What's up, Mike? Not much, man. How are you tonight? Oh, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. It's been a long day, uh, but but happy to be here recording the podcast. And uh, got to hang out with my wife this afternoon. So on the back porch, had a beer, uh, cooked some spaghetti squash and turkey Ooh. sausage or turkey burger. I put, I put, so I had spaghetti sausage. Sorry. It has been a long day. <laughs> you ever had spaghetti sausage? Just let me tell you. Um, I, I took a spaghetti squash and put turkey sausage on top of that and then put honey buffalo sauce on top of that. And it sounds pretty basic, but it was very, very good. If you're, uh, if you're thinking of it, I think the whole, me and Hannah made that whole meal for $4 total. So if you're looking for a good budget meal that's tasty, Look up your uh, spaghetti sausage. <laughs> uh, we'll see. Well, I'll, let's just kind of fire back and forth. You you read a question, I'll read a question, and, and I'll kind of answer the questions you read to me, and, and vice versa, and then we'll both answer them at the end. You know, but but kind of fire them back and forth. If that makes sense. Sounds good to me. All right. Um, I'll start with one here. This one's from Josh Benton off okay. of the Eastern Current Instagram. Um, when fishing a new area, how do you start finding trout and fish or in redfish? The DOA shrimp. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, when I when I'm fishing a new area, I fish pretty fast. You know, there's there, I think there's really two thoughts, and that is slowing down and really picking an area apart and, and finding fish that way, or moving through an area quickly with bait with a bait that I'm confident in, and I'm not trying to catch every fish in that area. I'm just trying to get a bite. I'm trying to to figure out the areas that I need to slow down in and pick apart. Like I'm gonna power fish through an area until I get a bite, and then I'm gonna pick that area apart. Um, you know, you might miss some fish that way, and you might not get all the bites, but you're gonna get those aggressive bites, and that's gonna key you in, I believe, on, on those productive areas typically. And that's kind of how I roll my routine day in and day out when I'm out scouting by myself. I'm looking for those high percentage areas and those aggressive fish. Um, fishing baits that you know might be a little more aggressive, like a chatterbait or a buzzbait or a topwater uh, or spinnerbait, 
not a buzz bait. I've never fished a buzz bait for redfish <laughs> or trout. Uh, trout, trout, you know, same deal. Work a little bit quicker, but that whole quicker pace has slowed down a little bit more than redfish. Uh, but it is still quicker than like, all right, if I know there's trout on this bank, I'm going to really creep along it and pick it apart until I figure them out. Um, you know, I might make, let's say I've got a hundred yards of bank for redfish. I might make 10 casts, you know, yeah. maybe more 15. If I've got a hundred yards of bank for trout, I might make 30 casts if that makes yeah. sense. So what about you? Um, I think for me, I started with like online mapping and this is a little different, school of thought here yeah. but you know like i have areas in mind where i know i catch fish every year you know where i catch trout or i catch redfish that consistently produce i can't go visually see the marsh all the time i'm a weekend warrior for the most part i don't get a lot out during the you know during the week um so for me i'll go sit down on google maps google earth and i, I just pick apart the areas i see what i can find I know that's productive. And I see if I can find other spots that look very similar to it um, in other areas. Um, that's kind of my biggest thing. And then from there, put boots on the ground, you know, go get in the boat, go see if it really looks like that. Yeah. And like you say, then I start the power fishing part. Yeah. You know, and I might have a certain area that I really want to focus on, but I fish a lot of the little areas around that very quickly and then i might slow down and fetch one or two particular areas within that see if i get bites if not move on you know yeah yeah so yeah. i think that's huge I, I think not getting too hung up on an area just because it looks good is important especially in yeah. north carolina where our maybe our fish populations aren't key like in louisiana i can if 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 it looks like there should be fish there this isn't always true but if it looks like there should be fish there there's usually fish there there's a yeah. thousand places on our coast that look like there should be fish there that don't have fish there. Um, so, yeah. you know, really keying in on what is productive for you in the past and, and running that kind of trend. I mean, they're such creatures of habit and they, you know, every redfish from freaking uh, Mexico to Virginia is going to key in on the same stuff underwater. And so trying to figure out what that is and kind of run that pattern is, is key. So. They're not different just because they're in different states. You know, we just, you know, we have different estuaries and different bodies of water, but the fish want the same thing. So, um, yeah, I think that's a good answer for that one. So, you got it. You got anything else on that? And we'll kind of roll through these quick. I don't know how long this is going to take. If it's going to take us a long time to get through all these questions, or we'll roll through them pretty quick. But we'll see. Um, no, I think that's it for that one. Cool. Uh, well, this was Eric Tumas or T U M A S. Eric Tumas. I'm terrible at pronouncing names so or for, don't apologize to me forgive me if I pronounce that the wrong way um, so they, he said go into detail on where to run in the morning based on tide wind and water um, so I'm guessing water quality you know wind conditions if it's heavy light wind and what the tide's doing kind of let's just talk about this time of year right now like I'll give you a a condition here so all right okay. low tide first thing in the morning 12 to 15 mile an hour winds out of the north and slightly tingy water because we just had some rain. That's pretty typical October. Yeah. Um, ooh, that's tough. I got two. two the low tide in the morning sucks. Yeah. low tide. Because <laughs> you're thinking trout. Um, so I think for, for trout, I go anywhere I can find deep water. Even if it's low tide, um, if that's near an inlet. I'll definitely go try to find some deeper water, but I try to find a creek or the edge of the clean water. The e you know, not where it's super dirty, like the inland creeks that are coming from the mainland dumping into the intercoastal. I'll try to stay away from that and get back into the marsh where there's yeah. a little cleaner water. Um, and then depending on the wind and the wind direction, from there I kind of decide which, you know, which pockets do I stay right at the mouth or do I go farther back into the creeks? Okay. Um, and I think that just has to do with how can I get the boat in the right position to fish the way that I want to make sure that I'm getting a good presentation. Yeah. I, I like um, that. I don't want to sit, you know, I don't want to sit at a Creek mouth that I know should have fish, but the wind's blowing out of the North blowing me right back on top of the fish and I'm having to run the trolling motor super heavy or something like that. You know, I'd rather go around one bend 
and try the next spot. And if I pick up a fish there, then maybe try to, you know, get a different angle or something for the, the spot before it or something, you know. I just kind of let the wind predict where I need to be sitting and where I can pre- present the best bait to the fish. Yeah, I, I think that's important for sure. Um, and, and just to break this down into a simple answer, it's like, all right, if I've got a low tide or a dead high tide in the morning this time of year to where I don't have much current movement, I'm probably going to start out with some redfish spots. If it's a higher tide, you know, low all right, so if it's a high tide, low current in the morning, um, whether it's windy or calm or whatnot, I'm probably going to start out throwing top water for, for redfish. Um, if it's a low tide, I'm going to start out throwing jigs and, you know, working the bottom for redfish in some pockets and some bins and some creeks. Um, if I've got, you know, that mid tide moving in and out, I'm probably going to be trout fishing and throwing top water for trout, you know, uh, along the banks, along some of the points, along the inlets. Um, and that, that's a really loaded question. It's a good question, but there's so many combinations of those yeah. tide, wind, and water that are going to play into it. So you've got to break it down and be like, I, I would really start with my tide because that's the big, biggest dictator of, of what you're going to be able to fish for. Um, yep. And so if you've got good current movement around those mid-tides, trout, if you're at the bottom or the top with very little current movement, redfish. That, that would be my best answer. And then within that that's going to dictate what you throw, what you work, uh, as far as a lure goes based off of the wind and water conditions. If the water's nice and clean, something a little more natural. If it's dirty, something a little flashier. Uh, if it's really windy, fish a bait that's got a little more weight to it. So you can really have a good connection with it in the wind. If it's nice and calm, DOA shrimp. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> I really need a DOA sponsor, a sponsorship. Yeah. So. <laughs> You're um, working on it. Every podcast. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I don't. I just want the shrimp. I just want the DOA shrimp. I think I probably already spent two hundred dollars on them since the month a month and a half ago. Mostly because of lizard fish. Oh, let's take thirty seconds and explain the fish that you caught the other day. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So Judd's like, all right, we're gonna go try one of my redfish spots. It's been pretty good at a lower tide. Let's go see if we can find them at a higher tide. That'll give me, you know, a little bigger window to slide in there and fish. I'm like, all right, cool, whatever. So hop on the boat, run back there, drop the trolling motor, get in position, make the first cast, nothing. We sat there for, I don't know, what, five, ten minutes maybe. I know, my spots suck, right? <laughs> Not a whole lot of action. And then all of a sudden, just out of nowhere, just – Lure takes off, or bait takes off, gets eaten. Hook up. We're like, oh, it's a good one. It's going right up to the grass bank, you know. Yeah, like like head up in the grass like a redfish will a lot of times. Yeah. Definite redfish on. Get out beside the boat. What have we got? Probably what? I don't know. Four-pound lizard fish? I mean, definitely over three pounds. It was massive. It was huge. I mean, you couldn't get your hands around it. It was like you could only get your hands about halfway around the, the fish. Yeah massive it was huge i mean it was i got some pictures i'll I'll throw some pictures up we'll put a picture on the eastern current uh instagram Uh, all right fire your next question at me all right um this one is from tristan and he asked what do we look for when trying to locate trout in the fall slash winter um let's let's take that question and let's break it down let's go typical fall and then typical winter, because there there's a huge change there, Definitely. at least in my fishing, and I know there is in yours, because we fish a lot of the same stuff during trout season wide. Yeah. So, I don't know. Let's let's break it down like that. Yeah, definitely. So, um, in the fall, I'm looking for higher current areas uh, where there's a lot of bait moving through. Like this time of year, we got a lot of mullet flushing out around the inlets. Um, looking for just good ambush areas for the, the these fish. And it might be breaks uh, in the current that are very obvious because of the bank structure. And it might be stuff on the bottom. So I'm looking for current that gives me ability to fish those types of breaks and holding areas for these trout. Um, starting close to the inlet and as the, the water temperature drops, I'm working my way further and further away from the inlet. Not that you can't catch the fish further away from the inlet from the get-go, but you're looking for these mass groups, these mass populations of migratory fish um, coming in, and this has been what's been the best for me. And so 
Um, as that water temperature drops, the whole reason these fish come down here from up north is to try to find a, a water temperature that they can survive throughout the winter. Um, and so as that water temperature drops cooler and cooler, my fishing tactics become slower. I'm looking for less current. I'm looking for deeper water. So I go from fishing three feet of water near the inlet on like a ripping tide where I get about three seconds on my cast before my bait's skipping on the surface behind me to, you know, 15 feet deep in a boat basin, you know, hopping a jig and letting it sit there for eight seconds on the bottom and then hopping the jig again. So that's my transition from, from slow to, to, or from, from fall to winter, like fall, early fall, aggressive areas, areas where you catch blue fish and shore, you know, like these areas that, that these fish are okay working hard for a meal to where they're really trying to survive and, and sit in an area where they exert very little energy, um, being, you know, deep creeks, deep bends in creeks. Like I had multiple citations last year um, in, in these creeks and these just deep pockets. You know, it, it might be a creek that's three to six feet deep and then there's like a nine foot hole, 10 foot hole in there. And it doesn't look like there's anything in there, but if you take your time working up those creeks in the dead of winter um, and, and fishing a, you know, very translucent or kind of natural looking soft plastic or even a live bait, you can catch some really big trout like that. The amount of trout it took me to roll over those holes and spook massive gator trout out of those holes in the winter way back in the marsh, it's like, all right, this year I'm going to start, I'm going to start taking my freaking time and picking every one of those holes apart going up. I mean, I've yeah. sat there and made, I know you have two 20 casts in a hole in January. Yeah. And, and then I, I trolling motor across it and like three massive trout come out of it and leave. So, yeah. I was going to say, I think, yeah, for that, I mean, even back in these big creeks that just have bays that have deeper water at higher tides, um, I feel like are great spots, especially when it gets into later winter, um, late fall, early winter kind of times um, is kind of where I go. I've got one or two that I kind of focus on that are kind of my indicator spots of yeah. when they make that transition. And... You know, this is something we probably, for me and Judd both, this is stuff that we've learned from years of doing it, like he said, spooking fish out, pulling over them, running over them with a trolling motor, whatever it is. We're like, all right, how do we how do we find that fish or how do we catch that fish, you know, now that we've located where they're sitting at? And it's just it's a lot of years of putting in the time to come up with some of this stuff. So... You know, don't be frustrated when you're first starting out and you're looking for fish. You know, if you go out and you get hit once or twice during the day, you know those fish are there. Try them on a different tide. Try them on a, you know, maybe wait a week or two and come back and try them again, whatever. Yeah. You know, with a different water temperature, different water quality, different wind, something like that. And you'll start to pick up on those key times of when they're sitting in these certain areas in your area, you know, because... Yeah fish kind of a a little bit of a different area than a, a lot of people are dealing with whether you're in the outer banks and big bays or you're farther south and you have a lot more tide change um so you know all of these fish like you said are looking for the same thing so it's just a, a constant trial and error yeah i agree uh, it, it's definitely just playing with it day in and day out and something might work incredibly well on monday and on wednesday it might not work at all yeah. Um, and so that's why having a lot of stuff in all of your back pockets <laughs> is important. Um, all right. So our next question comes from Roger Jones, and he says, this is a good question. When do you give up on artificial and go to live bait? Do you fish the same areas with both methods, or is it, a lo or is it location driven? Um, what's your what's your goal on that? Oh, man. All right. So typically when we start getting our first run of mullet during the spring – is when I start to change over to live bait. Um, I feel like there's just something about having live bait when you're, even though you're trying to compete against live bait with a live bait, being able to rig it in a certain way with a jig head and get it below the spool of mullet, get it down on the bottom, or however you want to present your mullet, you know, it gives it something a little different. So I think, you know, spring, um, Sometimes it's not even spring. Like this year, it was June before I even went to start really fishing live bait. I was doing good on artificial, and the mullet weren't super strong yet until kind of June for me. 
So, you know, once they come in full force, I feel like that's when I switch over. Yeah. Um, as far as location, I'm fishing the same places I fish with artificial. Um, I don't really change locations as much. I just kind of change the tactics that I'm using. Yeah. Um, I think for me it's pretty simple. It's like uh, same deal. I, I'm not fishing. I mean, maybe there's a few areas that I just fish bait or just fish artificials. I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Um, yeah. But if I know there's fish in an area and they're hard to get them to eat, I'm struggling to catch some artificials, but I know it's worth my time to be there. That's when I throw. Yeah. That's when I throw live bait typically. Um, or you know, and that's for pleasure. If it's a guide trip, you know, if it's the right clients, or I think they're going to enjoy, you know, the higher productivity sometimes that live bait brings I'll, I'll do that but um, for myself if i want to go out and fish and i know the productive how productive the live bait's going to be in a certain area against artificial i'll fish that um, i'm not against live bait i'm not against artificial i love fly fishing i mean i love it all and i love learning by trying all these different tactics and all these different styles of fishing uh, and, and i kind of get frustrated with people that want to just kind of stick to one thing because you are shortchanging yourself so much like the amount that you can learn by fishing tons of different types of lures and different types of rods bait casters conventional rods and reels spinning reels fly rods center pins you know there's just so much different crap that you can learn that's going to make you a better angler across the board and that's kind of the whole hope of this podcast is that we yeah. just open your eyes to all these different types of fishing and areas to fish and ways to catch these fish um and just become a good angler in general. Like I'd rather have the title of like an incredible angler than like, oh, he's a really good fly caster. You know, I could care less about being a good freaking fly caster. Um, you know, a good fly caster. I don't know. That, that's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> that just started started rambling hard there. But uh. when I pick up bait for myself is when I'm like, oh crap, there's some big ass trout in that spot. And I can't get him to eat a jig. I can't get him to eat a DOA shrimp. I'm going to go float a mud minnow through there on a float and catch one. Or there's a bunch of redfish in this pocket. And I can sight fish them, but I can't get him to eat the jig. It's January. And I put a mud minnow on a circle hook with a split shot and pitch it out there and pop that thing. And then I can't resist that. So that's kind of my my go-to on live bait. This morning I fished live bait. Um, I had a mom and two kids. And they just wanted to catch fish. They could care less what it was on. And so being yep. able to kind of move into an area, see the school moving around on an edge and pitch those live baits out in front of them and allow them to just sit there and marinate instead of them having to like work the jig properly and feel the bite, like it, that worked well for us then as well. So um, there's not like a hard fast, just like anything in fishing, there's not a hard fast rule that I follow, but that's kind of kind of my, my basis um, there. So this is taking us a long time to get through all these questions. So. <laughs> Yeah, all good. Maybe if one of us answers them well, we'll just one of us will answer a question. All right. Is that up to me? Yeah, I think it's your turn. All right. Um. So John Futrell, he had a few questions for us. Um. So he asked, "Do you start topwater again once the sun gets low in the afternoons?" Yeah, definitely. You're, yeah, I, I definitely do. Um. I don't, I don't catch myself throwing topwater for trout as much in the evening as I do redfish. Uh, and and there, that's not because it can't be done. It's not that you can't catch trout in the evening on topwater. Um, but, you know, you get that mid to high tide, like maybe a little bit past mid tide coming over the oyster bars this time of year. Um, redfish will annihilate a topwater plug. So I definitely fish in the evening. Any low light condition. Today we were having redfish. We were fishing bait on a cork middle of the day the redfish were so fired up the mullet under the cork would start freaking out and swimming and the cork would be coming across the surface and the other redfish were coming up and smashing the cork on the surface i was like oh, i want to be <laughs> throwing awesome. a topwater plug but we, we just kept fishing bait uh, all my corks have teeth like crusher marks all over them i'll, I'll have to take a picture and send it to you it's pretty crazy um, that's awesome but it, like i said it was just easy for easier for us and and most enjoyable for for them to you know, to them to catch it on a top water or a or a live mullet, that it there was no difference. So it, you know, go with what's yep. going to be, you know, the most satisfying to your client. Um, but yeah, top water in all low light conditions and all the time. Like just keep throwing top water. Have it always tied on a rod and pick it up and throw it. 
every once in a while, especially when you're trout fishing. I think we talked about that in our last po- in our last two podcasts, probably. Yeah. So, all right, Duncan Conley. I'm a fly guy and find it hard to pick spinning to pick spinning rods and reels. Any tips? So, um, I think he's asking like he wants to buy spinning rods and reels because he's only fly yeah. fished. What should I get? Um, I'm gonna say Fenwick HMG and a pin conflict or a pin clash. That would be my suggestion for, you know, what you should. It's a great rod. The the Fenwick has like an over the counter warranty. If you break it, you take it in. They'll replace it for you. Um, yep. And the pin reels, they're just time tested. All reels are going to give up on you eventually. I've had Daiwas, Shimano's, pins, Florida fishing products, and all of them, you know, crap it eventually. one day. So, and most of them within a year. And so, uh, my pin conflicts honestly have lasted me. Pin conflicts and Daiwa BGs have been the two reels that have lasted me the longest. I don't really like how heavy the BGs are. Um, I like the conflicts better. And yeah. we'll see as far as how much longer they last than a BG. So far, I haven't had them as long as I've had my BGs, but um, I don't fish BGs anymore. But I, I think I got about two and a half years out of the BGs. They weren't in perfect condition, but they were still, you know, charter worthy. Yeah. What about you? Um, I think for me, I really like the Star Rods. Yeah, um, you do like Star I Rods. I fish a lot of the like Stellar Light series um, is what I've really switched over to. I've gone from – I'm from the mountains. I grew up a little south of Asheville, so I grew up bass fishing and that kind of stuff and fly fishing in the mountains for trout. And I come down here and I thought, oh, I need you know super heavy rods and that kind of stuff. And you know, when we first started fishing, you know, we were figuring it out. We were learning and i have some older stuff that's just really heavy and i love the fact of now that i've you know kind of got past that and got into the star rods and stuff a lot lighter action rods you can really fill the rod load up yeah. you can fill they're really sensitive you know especially if you're a fly person you're used to watching either your dry fly or you know if you got a strike indicator or whatever if you're streamer fishing you're used to that sensitivity in the line having that longer rod um I don't know. I just really like them. And then I've got Quantum Smokes on part of mine. And then I have the Shimano Nasia, I think is what it's called. Yeah. Um, I've got a oh, like the Nasi? Nasi? Yeah, Nasi yeah. or whatever. Um, I've had it for a year and a half, and I haven't had an issue out of it yet. Yeah. Like, it's been a, you know, killer, uh, killer reel. Heck yeah. So... The only end too, I like. I love the fact that the smokes are super light, and sort of the star rods. Yeah. I love the split grip. So I like the know, split grips too. That that's just kind of where I'm coming from. But yeah, and that's all personal preference too. Um, you know, if you're yeah. wanting to inshore fish and light tackle fish, I go for a medium light and a three thousand reel, three thousand class reel. Um, yeah. And you don't have to b- break the bank. Like neither of none of what me and Mike talked about was crazy expensive, especially not compared to fly setups. Um, yeah, you know, I've got okay. fly setups that are over a thousand dollars easy. You know, over two thousand dollars. Some of them where you're paying, yeah. you know, you got well maybe fifteen to eighteen hundred bucks for a fly setup, yeah. um, and you can get an incredible spinning rod and reel for two hundred and fifty bucks. I mean, you can get an incredible okay. rod and reel setup for one hundred fifty bucks. But um, you know, it, it, it's just like a boat. It's just like anything that we use as a as a tool. Um, you do get what you pay for a lot of times and, and taking good care of your reel and your rod off the water is just as important as on the water, spray it off, um, you know, store it in somewhat climate control area and she'll keep kicking for you. Oh, me. Yeah. I think you're up. All right. Um, so John Putro also had another question for us. What have you had the best of luck with? and inshore kind of per season um okay he's a weekend warrior and he gets a couple afternoons a week or a month to go fishing you know that last little bit of the day um after work and he's just kind of curious you know towards the end of the day what do we have best of luck with or what do we have best of luck with per season it's kind of yeah yeah sweet um i definitely like the seasons. I like following the seasons and it keeps things interesting for me. And I think it's important as an angler to like change it up. Like I was saying earlier, you learn so much from different species and targeting different species. Also, it just keeps you 
interested. Like if I just fished for redfish inshore in shallow water every single day, I would lose my mind. Uh, yeah. Because it it just any of that gets redundant. So I'd say summertime belly crawling redfish is what I really try to focus all my trips on. Like if I've got someone that wants to sight fish or fly fish, I'm gonna look for you know low mud banks and and grass shrimp and belly crawling redfish. Uh, fall like this time of year albacore and speckled trout um in the spring again speckled trout um, dead of winter big schools of redfish and deep holes in the marsh um in the spring cobia i like cobia fishing and what else do we have in the spring redfish schools of redfish bonita Bonita, i like bonita fishing i like getting offshore and doing some bottom fishing um going to the gulf stream and doing some ahi fishing so i just think keeping things changing but but uh, Talking about like, let's talk about what's relevant right now, and that's trout fishing. We got you know cooler weather around the corner. We've got our, our migration of trout that should be pushing in any time. And I've got to be honest, I am getting nervous about the speckled trout fishery um, with how pounded they were by gill nets last year. Um, and I've talked to some buddies. I had a conversation with a guy this afternoon who had an incredible year last year fishing out of Virginia Beach for speckled trout. And has seen very few trout. Very, very slow days. He was this time of year last year. He was crushing it, catching, you know, tons and tons of fish and big fish. And he hasn't been catching them this year. Very slow numbers. And I know we, a lot of fish have been taken out. I, feel, I think he. Let me let me look this up. He sent me. Uh, we always get into some type of conservation. Talk here. <laughs> um, he said. 52,000 pounds in four weeks. That's a lot of trout. He said our haul sains went overboard too. So 52,000 pounds in four weeks were killed up there in the Chesapeake Bay, um, let alone what was killed down here. And this is all the same population of fish that moves up and down the coast. Yep. You Pamlico. Know, Pamlico fish that, that get crushed in gill nets up there and pound nets and our gill net or fish that get killed in gill nets down here. So redfish are not the only fish that, that are hurting from our, our netting industry. Um, tell someone about gill nets. That's what I'm going to say on this podcast. Is just tell someone about you know the effects that inshore trawling and gill nets have on our fishery, even if they fish or if they don't fish. Just spread the word. Um, we'll get back into some of our questions. But trout fishing, <laughs> trout fishing is uh, what I'm going to be focusing on now. Hopefully we get a good push of fish. Um, I know it's starting to fire up in the noose a little bit. They've got a net ban up there. Um, Mike, we actually just got an invite to go up there to fish with some guys. I got off the phone with them today. Um, They want to do a a little video recording, so we'll talk about that later. Um, Did John have any other questions? Uh, No, that was was it. Okay, cool. Um, Lee Singleton said, biggest tailing redfish you've ever caught. Oh, boy. Do we have to stay in North Carolina? No. Because I got your story. (laughs) <laughs> no, we'll just tell that story. I think my biggest tailing redfish was in Louisiana, 30 to 40 pounds. But that that's a good story. You can tell that story real quick. A little quick oh. a little quick version of it. All right. Yeah, so me and Judd, we went down years ago, fished Louisiana for the first time. And I hadn't got to make the trip down with him again for a few years. So we went, not last year, but the year before. Um, so two years ago. And... Judd had already put me on a few fish. I was like, dude, let me, let me, please, let me pull you. You know, let's go look for some big fish for you. So he gets on the bow. I get him down a bank. We've seen a couple small fish. We turn around. We're going to the next little pocket over. And right in the mouth of this little bay is two big, like, probably, what, 30, 35-pound redfish? Yeah, I'd say anywhere from 25 to 35 pounds. They were just stacked on top of one another mudding up everything tails just wagging beautifully right there and judd puts the fly in them they don't eat so i'm like holding the boat back a little bit judd's like all right let me switch rods let me get something that you know chartreuse bright that they can see with all this mud going on flips it back in there strip 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 bam nails the just nails one and i don't know i think that's probably one of my favorite fishing stories from oh that was a fun one it's just so sick when those fish are I mean, we were ju- had just finished scraping bottom in the skiff and, and got out. I yeah. mean, it was 10 inches deep, and these were 30-inch fish and 10 inches, 12 inches of water, Yeah, um, which is just so cool. I mean, 
and seeing him tail is cool too. That whole pond system right there, man. That is that was always such a great tailing <laughs> redfish spot. Like middle of the day, late in the day. Golly, I miss yeah. fishing Louisiana. <laughs> I wish I was going. I don't wish I was going on there soon. I'm so thankful and glad I'm staying here with my family. But I, I do miss it. I do miss going down there and, you know, pulling around and seeing those massive pumpkins floating around and casting to them. Um, that whole trip was just epic. That me and Judd just need to have a story podcast and share that and like pictures and some stuff. I oh, feel that'd like. be fun. That would be fun. That well, was a good trip. Yeah. Um. All right, I'm gonna go with another one. Taylor right. Mahaffey. Man, ha- Manafi. Ma- it's either Mahaffey or Manafi. My terrible handwriting is going to mess me up, so I apologize. But Taylor said, um, how do you find fish in less than ideal conditions? Um, and that kind of comes – for me, That I'm going to go into this one real quick because I, I was thinking about this one I wrote down. That to me boils back into your leg work before your less than ideal conditions, knowing where you need to focus your time. Go to an area that you know is productive. Don't do a bunch of scouting in terrible conditions. Go beat up the areas that you know have fish in them. Um, yep. and, and be okay with not crushing it. Be okay with, with, with getting some bites and catching some fish in some areas that you've put in the, the legwork and, and done your homework and you know that there's some trout, you know that there's some redfish and flounder in there. And go work hard and get a couple bites and get a couple fish to the boat. That's kind of how I break that down. Um, yeah. Now, if those places don't pan out, there's two there's two. Um, you know, kind of ways to think about it, and that is power fish, which is one thought, or really pick an area apart slowly. And, and I think that it's more important when the conditions suck to really pick an area apart for one or two bites, rather than rather than trying to crush an area and and get a thousand casts and look for an aggressive. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. not get a, get a, get a thousand casts in an area. For a few bites is what I would do. You know, really pick an area apart. Yep. Do you, do you have anything say, different than that? No, I, I would agree with that. I think my, I think with those kind of conditions, I might try something like areas that I know that typically hold fish. I might work on the fringes of that a little bit. I'm going to go in and work like my high percentage area. And if I don't do anything, I'm going to drop off. I'm going to go fetch a few areas around that to see if those fish may have moved or done something different because the conditions are a little different. And then if that doesn't pan out, I'll come back and retry that same area again, especially during trial season. I'm fishing some of these places three times a day. Yeah. You know, and not that I'm sitting there for, you know, two, three hours at a time, but I'm going in there. I'm going to fish for 30, 45 minutes at most and if i haven't gotten anything I, that gives me enough time to fish the area that i wanted to fish a little bit on either side of it or around it go try something else and then i'll come back to that same spot and try it again on a slightly different tide um or maybe the weather's changed a little bit the pressure's changed a little bit and i come back and i'll try that same spot again so agree redfish will eat on any tide. If you're not getting bites, they're not there. Trout yeah. will definitely turn on and off due to the tide. You know, they could yeah. be there and you could not be catching them. So I think that's cool. All right, you got another question? Um, I don't think I have any anything else right here from Instagram that's okay, cool. like questions for today. Cool. I got a bunch here, so I'll start firing them off. Um, all right, so... Um, Mike Matson says, how does pressure and wind change inshore fishing conditions? I'm going to let you take that one because you're a lot better at describing it than I am. Okay, so um, barometric pressure definitely plays a role in fishing. It plays a role in my guiding too. You know, it's, it's definitely something that I pay attention to. You really, I mean, as a weekend warrior, you could say, hey, you know, it doesn't look good. I'm not going to go for my... Myself, just because there's high barometric pressure doesn't mean I, I can't cancel trips due to barometric pressure. A lot of times, high pressure days are beautiful days out on the water. Um, and it, it can definitely hurt the bite. What I love, like my favorite conditions for fishing are a low pressure before a cold front, five days before or after, you know, three to five days before or after new moon, or just around that new moon. That For redfish, for trout, especially for trout, um, that's kind of what I look for. High pressure, I feel like, can hurt the bite. It push, pushes the redfish deeper, pushes the trout deeper. Um, imagine, like, you know, they've got these these migraine headaches, and they're, they're wanting to get deeper in that water to be a little bit further away from what's going on. 
a slower presentation or even fishing bait can really be key that during you know a high pressure day. Um, one thing that I that I always share with clients, and this is a uh, kind of a observation that I've made just through networking. I'm always talking with other captains and other anglers on the water every day when I'm on the water, um, just kind of trying to get a feel of what's happening and what's going on. My buddies that that do a lot of mainly um, bait fishing while they're guiding or just through their fishing, the days that I have really good days, really shallow and see a lot of fish and get a lot of shot sight fishing, they typically say, you know, it was a little bit slower of a day. Um, and the days that is really, are really slow for me and I see nothing shallow. A lot of times my buddies that are bait fishing or fishing, you know, a little bit deeper water, um, have really good days. And so that, that to me shows that this pressure pushes these fish shallow and deep doesn't necessarily always affect the bite. Um, but it just affects where these fish are hanging out. So paying attention to that can definitely be key. Um, yeah. you good? Good on Yeah. That. Okay. So, yeah. I, you nailed it. Um, Brandon Pew Pew, um, yeah. or Brando at Brando Pew Pew, which is a sweet Instagram name. Um, what makes up a good redfish spot? Redfish are kicking my butt this year. Take it away. Ooh. All right. I think for – I'm going to break this Redfish down. make up a good redfish spot. Yeah. No, I think I'm going to break this down a little bit to like a summertime versus like kind of a winter fall yeah. time thing. Um, summertime, I'm a little bit more looking for grass, kind of flooded grass, depending on the tide. If it's high tide, you know, they're going to push farther back into flooded grass. It doesn't necessarily have to be like oysters or a point or anything um it can just be a big mud flat that they're sitting on sometimes but there's little sparse grass and stuff for them to be able to work some bait around um so that doesn't necessarily help like narrow it down a ton but i'm looking for i'm looking for that off of like a main creek or something in that situation yeah. once it gets to like fall time winter time i'm looking for more of like oysters um, hard banks a lot of times where you know a school can push down and they can feed a lot easier um, I think that's probably like my two big you know big differences yeah for yeah. me at least um, but I mean you could you know if you got a point with an oyster bar and you've got grass right up on the edge there it's real shallow you know that could be killer any time of the year for redfish yeah but um, you know I feel like that kind of delineates a little bit between summer and fall winter cooler weather for me yeah for for me and it's all personal preference i mean redfish are they hang out in a lot of different stuff um, yeah but i like shallow the dead ends with flooded grass you know where the by flooded grass i mean you, get, you it's not just a hard grass bank it's like little sparsely pocketed grass that that floods up where these fish can come and lay up at a higher tide I like oyster bars i like points i like flats near creeks so an area these fish can slide up on into shallow water if they want to, but they can also very quickly drop off into a deeper gut uh, and feel secure there. Um, sometimes they're going to feel better in shallow water. Sometimes they're going to feel better in, in deep water. Like today, a lot of the fish that we were targeting in the three different spots that we caught them in were hanging along those edges where the flat meets the deeper water. And they're kind of coming up there and flashing on the edges and eating bait and then dropping back down. And, and the mullet, as the tide was dropping, were kind of getting flushed over. Um, off the shallow water into the deeper water and the fish are blowing them up on the surface right there. Um, kind of cool when you just sit still and watch that. You know, we're kind of sitting back instead of chasing them around, you're sitting back and seeing all that happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, just this time of year, um, high percentage bait areas where there's going to be a lot of bait pushing through. I say high percentage all the time. Now, this podcast, like every two months, I'll have like a key word that I say a lot <laughs> and it's like my new word, but um, it used to be I like it. I was like I like it. I like it. Um, but yeah, I th I'd say that's it for redfish. I think you nailed it. Um, our next question is from John Clement, um, and it says Savage Gear Prop Walker or Whopper Plopper for specs? Question mark. So he's asking, have we fished a Whopper Plopper style bait for speckled trout? I'm gonna leave that one to you because I do not. All I fish is standard skitter walks and that kind of stuff spooks that you know a normal walk the dog bait um oh, with so you. I feel like you you're better on that one than me i mostly fish a walk the dog style bait and i talked about in some of our trout podcasts recently that uh, i do enjoy fishing a wake bait as well on real slick calm conditions um and i have fished a whopper plopper style bait i prefer an el chapo 
which is made by Berkeley. Um, it's a killer, killer bait. There's a matte black El Chapo that the trout, like at first light, will annihilate. Um, I, I'm always looking for a topwater plug or style bait that is easy for clients to fish um, and return easy for your guests to maybe fish if you're going out to trout fish this fall and you know you get in a good topwater bite and you just can't get them in time. You can't take the time to show them how to work a topwater plug. Um, have a wake bait or two on the boat and have a prop bait or two on the boat. So um, definitely check out um, Berkeley's El Chapo. One, it's just an absolutely incredible name. Um, but two, it's a it's a great bait. The mat the mat midnight black El Chapo is a is a killer killer nighttime and like very low light bait. Um, but yeah, it's a great bait for specs. I kind of reel it one two three pause it one two reel it one two three pause it one two um, and you can change that up. And I've caught them just straight retrieving it. I, I'll, honestly, I've caught a few redfish on whopper plopper style baits. But they don't seem to like it as much as a as a walk the dog style plug. So, um, correct. Let me know if y'all have done really well on them. I know they'll eat them, but I've definitely thrown them in areas where the redfish are fired up and eating plugs and had them eat the top water walk the dog plug way better. Um, now, big bull redfish I've, in Louisiana, I've had them eat the big whopper ploppers really really well, um, and you could bomb them and work them real well. Um, big jacks as as well, but. Um, yeah, having a having an assortment of plugs for topwater fishing for trout is key. Get you some El Chapos. Um, all right, Stephen Ols O L S Z A N O W S K Olzanowski. I'm just butchering all of these. Um, <laughs> best boat positioning when fishing for trout. Take Ooh. it away. Um. All right. When I'm working trout, I always try to get on the down current side. So if the tide's coming in, that always makes for an issue, um, at least for a lot of the places I fish. So I end up taking two or three different creeks to get around to get on the right side of the fish. Um, but the reason that I like the down current side is because of the fact the bait's always coming back to me and you can always get a very good natural drift to it. Yeah. Um, especially like fishing DOAs and a lot of times once we start getting into mid fall when that water temperature really drops, dead sticking a bait, jig head with a paddle tail even, you know, I'm just letting it, I'm, I'm fishing super light, you know, an eighth ounce, which isn't super light, but when you put a Z-Man or something that's a, you know, a more buoyant In paddle current. tail behind it, you know, that allows for that eighth ounce to be able to just stay in contact with the bottom and keep moving along on the current. So down current a lot of times. The other option that I do, and this is on a lower tide situation, especially on an incoming, is I power pull down the boat, hop off in my muck boots, and I walk down the bank and I'll fish, you know, 20, 30, 40 yards sometimes, hop in, move the boat down, and I'll keep doing that. That way I can get up on the bank, walk around, Get a little extra height to be able to see in the water and roll those baits through there. Yeah, I like that. Um, my my kind of go to when I'm fishing, you know, a lot of times I'm fishing two or three people off of a boat, um, is sitting parallel to the bank where the current's running, you know, either left to right or right to left, and I'm I'm throwing quartering up current just a bit, and so I'm kind of my key part of my 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 uh, retrieve retrieve of my bait is like as it's right out in front of me and then like a quarter of the way past me and then once it gets past that it's starting to swing up so you're just trying to kind of hop and bounce that bait or dead stick that bait through that little you know 15 foot window um and you're move i move the boat up with the current and that can de depending upon the you know if i'm fishing a creek mouth or a point or the winds whipping me around and in a weird way i could that can be different but i kind of like to sit off the bank um, and fish quartering up current and swinging that bait down through the current is kind of my go-to. Um, all right, Simon Walpole. I feel like I'm, I'm doubting how I wrote down all these names now. <laughs> um, but Simon said, how do you adjust leader weight as you get into the fall? So getting into fall, I go lighter and lighter. The, yep. the cooler the water gets, the less ability that it has to hold settlement sediment because it holds more oxygen, more air. Um, so therefore, you get a lot cleaner water. Um, with that, a downsize. I mean, there was times last year I was throwing six, eight-pound fluoro for trout. 
Um, that's not every day, so don't you know? Don't go out and buy a whole spool of six or eight pound fluoro and be like, that's the only thing you're gonna fish. Because it right is now, definitely nice to have, though. It, yeah, it's nice to have, especially during the winter time. If I'm focused specifically on trout for the day. Yeah. Um, and like we just said, a little lighter and a little lighter to where I can get that bait to stay right on the bottom, um, and dead stick or. So I'll either go down to like an eighth ounce and dead stick or I'll go to like a three sixteenths ounce jig head and I got just a very, very slow retrieve when I bring it back to me. Yeah. Um, it's kind of where I stay out during the winter time. Sweet. Yeah, I'm with you too. I, I keep dumbing it down until I feel like it's, you know, affected. When the water's real clean, I fish light leader. Um, those yeah. fish don't pull super hard anymore and... It, I think it does help, uh, especially with trout. With redfish, you know, I still kind of, I never go below that 15 pound, um, yeah. maybe 12 pound uh, if I'm fishing a heavier trout leader. But I fish, I fish six and eight. I mean, a lot of times in December, January, and February, if I'm trout fishing, I'm fishing eight to 10 pound leader, fluorocarbon leader. Um, top knot is what I, I really like now. Is what I'm, I'm fishing that a lot. But there's a lot of great um, leader companies out there. So. I- I've got last year the Yozuri Mainline Fluoro. It's like a hundred yard or two hundred yard spool of fluoro. Yep. I mean, it's it's not as clear as the leader material, but when you get down to that small, anyways, you know, right. don't don't feel like you have to go out and spend you know twenty dollars on a thing of Seaguar Blue Label. You know, you will be able to catch fish without having to spend that money, and don't go super like long long leaders you know i don't know i stick with maybe three to four feet at most yeah you know sometimes during the winter four to five but that's even super super rare yeah you know i'm with you i fish even shorter stuff than that a lot of times you know two feet yeah. a leader i also don't like casting my knot through my guides for the simple fact of beating the knot up you know you hook a big trout and that knot unravels you cut that knot a little leaving a little bit of tag can be key but it can still kind of as it hits over and over and over again um, kind of loosen that knot up and screw you over. Um, yep. All right. So, any difference between leader weight when throwing top water versus spinning bait versus soft plastic for you? Um, when I fish top water, I don't like top water. I don't really care. I'll stick with you know something heavier, and I think that's just for that initial like blow up and they turn that head and they really have a lot of force there so i try yeah. to stick with heavier leader when i throw top water um a lot of times it, that leader can kind of foul the plug a little bit too when it's in their mouth and having yeah. a little more abrasion resistance can be very important when you first hook that fish for that yep. reason it kind of drags across the plug or the hooks yep um and then as we get into suspending baits and jig heads and stuff i mean i go down super you know not super super low but like we were saying six eight ten somewhere in there yeah um in the winter time you're saying water yeah do what in the winter time you're saying yeah yeah okay cool um yeah i I mean i out of just convenience a lot of times i'm putting on the leader weight that i'm going to fish that day depending upon if it's redfish or trout i might change it up but i don't get super picky where like different baits are on different leaders you know in bass fishing you can get that picky um, and I'm not saying it can't help, but it's just not something I've chose to spend my time focusing on. So, um, all right. Any tips? This is from Tony. Any tips for fly fishing from a kayak and the salt marsh? Mm, I'm going to let you tackle that. Okay, sweet. I got some great tips. There's yeah. just one tip. Don't go unless it's going to be dead low negative tide. Look on Google Earth. Find the dark blue holes, dark green holes that you see on Google Earth back in the tight creeks uh, in the marsh behind um, for here, you know, figure eight, topsail, any of that stuff. Um, and go drag your kayak back in those little pockets and then just fish a clouser on sinking line or any type of bait on sinking line and just kind of hop out and walk the sandbar edges around those deep holes and blind cast in there and work it out. And then once you start catching some fish in some of those holes, be like, all right, I've got fish here. Uh, and then start staying with them as that tide comes in and learn what they're doing. But that kayak's a great tool to get back to some stuff that's, you know, some of these holding pools that all these fish are falling off the flats into these pockets um, when the yeah. tide's low. So go where no one else can go. Look for deep pockets that are near big flats and, you know, shallower areas and creeks where they're going to have to hold up. 
And I, I got buddies that go do that and crush it. So um, yep. it makes me want to have a kayak for that reason. My buddy, our buddy Dan Avant does that. And, you know, he picks the right days and goes. But, I mean, he smashes the redfish because he's getting to stuff that no one else can get to. These little deeper pockets where the fish are hanging out on massive flats and bigger flats, you know, when the tide gets low. So, um, all right. So Matt Shapiro said, what is your favorite rod and reel combo for the DOA shrimp? Um, for me, it's the seven foot medium light. I like that extra length to be able to, you know, bend that rod out and, and throw that light DOA. Um, I don't want to have to whip it too hard because that shrimp starts to slide down the hook pretty bad after it's fished a lot. Um, and so having having a, a, a longer rod with a little more flex gives you a little more finesse to throw that bait without really putting too much pressure on the shrimp. Um, I, I've been fishing on an HMG, one of the new HMGs lately, but there's a lot of great rods. The G Loomis rods are rods I fish a bunch as well, and, and uh, that medium light 7-foot G Loomis. Uh, what's the other little code for that? I can't remember. But but any, any of those 7-foot medium light, seven, even a 7-6 medium light would be a great rod for it. Do you have a, yeah, a rod so you prefer? A, well, I was going to say I got a 7.3 and then I have a, like a 6.9 and I use 7.3 more for the shrimp and stuff. And yeah. then the 6.9 is, you know, a little shorter, a little lighter just for um, jig heads and more of a dead sticking yeah. type thing. Um, yeah. But, I, I mean, I use my rods across the board for everything. You know, I don't have one rod that's like specific to everything i buy rods kind of with general ideas of what i want to do with them but i don't only fish them for yeah, that scenario definitely. or whatever you know definitely. yeah if you had so. you know a set of four rods for every um type of thing you do your garage might look kind of like my my garage <laughs> <laughs> yeah about 60 or 70 rods in there i know dude i gotta get rid of some of them but uh, uh, but yeah i like a seven to seven three to seven six for a for a shrimp, medium light, uh, a nice butt section in it, but a real flexy tip. But you you still want some rigidity. You don't want a ton of, you know, looseness to that tip because you still want to be able to bury that rod. And feeling when you're dead sticking or when you're you know swinging a bait, having really good feel is so important because um, a lot of times swinging a bait, you might have some belly in the line to where you, the fish might slam it, but it might just be like a very little tick. Um, because of wind and current and, and tension on the line. So um, having a, have a nice rod is, is key for, for trout. I, I, if you're going to spend money on a rod um, with a focus on it, do it for speckled trout fishing. Get yourself a good speckled trout fishing rod. So, um, and if you live locally, if you go to Intercoastal Angler, Andrew at Intercoastal Angler builds custom rods, Dune Billy custom rods. Go in there and say that Judd sent you. Uh, for, you heard about him on Eastern Current. Um, and get him to build you a custom trout fishing rod. Um, it's Dune Billy. I think it's just at Dune Billy on Instagram. I'm going to look it up real quick because I want people to buy rods from him because they are sick. Uh, yeah. Let's see here. Dune. Yeah, so Dune Billy 910. Uh, it's Andrew Biddix. Uh, Dune Billy custom rods builds just epic custom trout rods, all kinds of custom rods, but um, check them out. Um, all right, so best resource for tides and weather for a weekend warrior. Um, I like fish weather and yep. rise tides, R-I-S-E-T-I-D-E-S. -E -E I use NOAA. I use a bunch of other stuff as well. Um, but those two apps together are going to give you everything you need to know as a weekend warrior. Um, you can definitely get more nitpicky, and some people like to geek out a little bit more about the weather and the conditions. <coughs> I don't. I just kind of want the general idea of what's going to be going on. And uh, those two apps will give that to you. Do you have anything other that you like to use, Mike? Um, I use Fish Weather, and then with having a skip, just being able to only get a few miles off the beach, um, Surf Checks or some of the actual Surf Checks surf is a great, one, great one. Um, some of the webcams. Those are really good to check exactly what's going on in real time right off the beach. You can get the cams, that kind of stuff, especially if I'm going to try to sneak out and go Albi Fish or Bonita Fish, you know, whatever. Um, I'll use those, but I'm kind of like you. I just want a general just for the day of can I put in here or when do I need to be thinking about getting out of here? Can I get in there first thing or not? You know, it's kind of what I use them for. So, um, but fish weather is definitely probably the top one that I use, um, weather wise, yeah. wind wise. Yeah. So. I, I think that was a good point is using some of those, um, it, 
almost everywhere on the coast now has live webcams. And yeah. so uh, being able to look into that is, is pretty key. Find some live webcams around your area and just be able to get a good read on what's actually happening out there on the water. Um, so let's go into this last question here. Um, this one's also from Matt, and it says, how much wind is too much wind, or how do you deal with high wind days? Um, you know, I fish in a lot of windy stuff. I, I, I do cancel fly trips if it's really, really windy, or give people the option to, to cancel fly trips because the opportunity, at least here in North Carolina, on, on these smaller slot redfish is very, very tough when it's windy. Um, but... You know, not. I've had one of my favorite days trout fishing last year was with Ben Chesney from Intercoastal Angler um, on a low pre, a low front coming in, um, a cold front. Is a low front a thing? I just made that up tonight. Yeah, yeah low it, pressure. It, it cold was front. a low pressure cold front coming in. It was blowing like thirty, super high tide, and we smacked the trout. I mean, we didn't catch seventy trout, but we caught probably fifteen or twenty trout in two hours and. Um, just good quality fish in the wind. Uh, it was a lot of fun. It was a good day of fishing. And, and so don't be scared of the wind. Just, just learn how to fish in the wind because if you can, it's going to really open up more days for you to get out there because living on the coast, we deal with a lot of wind. Um, I think for me, like during the summer and stuff, it kind of puts me off a little more. Um, just because I know like if it's going to be super windy, it's hot. It's the middle of summer. Maybe I can go out and catch some fish. Maybe I won't. Right. But once it starts to get to this time of year into the winter, I mean, if it's blowing 30 and I got a day to go, I'm going. Yeah. You know, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that the fish turn on and off multiple times throughout the day as the pressure and the weather changes a little bit. So I know I always have a good chance of going out and catching something. Um, and if nothing else, I honestly sometimes these are the best days for me to go out and find schools of fish because the wind's blowing so heavy and the water you know the top of the water is just kind of nasty you can get a little closer or blow over some of these schools of fish especially redfish you don't necessarily spook them as bad and you find them and then you can kind of back off and take your time yeah. getting back on them yeah you know so it can be a good time you know depending on what you're doing which this kind of contradicts what we said a little bit earlier but you know fish those high percentage areas that you know that you're catching fish in if you're in a bay boat or something where you know you're limited to what you can and can't fish but if you can get back and you know if you're pulling or whatever looking for schools of redfish especially you know these are times of the year that i'll use a little bit to explore on those nastier days yeah definitely so. definitely yeah i don't think there's too much i mean there's definitely days that it's blowing too hard but you know, yeah. don't, don't be afraid of 25 mile hour winds, 30 mile hour winds. I mean, it, it's it's not as fun as fishing in five mile hour winds out in the north, but um, you have some great days of fishing in the wind, and yeah. it can make you better angler. So I think that's a good question to end on. That's all I had written down. I might have missed some questions on Facebook or something, but we're gonna start. I, w I would like to start doing some more of these. I think they're fun to do. Um, and, and now that we kind of know, maybe we'll limit it to be like, and we're right at an hour, so we're good, but we'll be like, oh, 15 questions kind of does it um, and and go from there. But, man, that was fun. That was cool, cool to answer those questions. It had me thinking a lot about kind of some stuff to do um, this fall and get, get my wheels turned a little bit. I hope it helped everyone that's listening and kind of got y'all's wheels turning as well, kind of getting you ready for this fall fishing. Um, you know, it's like seems like as soon as you kind of start to figure out a pattern, the seasons change up on you. Uh, and it's important to stay ahead of the curve. So, um, is there anything else you want to leave people with? Close with Mike before I shut her down. No, I think I think we've pretty much covered everything. So. Right on. Well, I'm Judd. And this is my friend here, Michael Bell, and we will see you in the next Eastern Current podcast later. <laughs>